Well, you've heard the gospel. You've heard it read twice, actually. <laughs> so I want to pull out just a few things from it that I think are very, very important today, especially as it applies to this dear group of people who are being confirmed. Two people are presented responding very differently to Jesus. One is the man born blind who is miraculously healed, and the other is the Pharisees. And we are invited by this story not just to hear the story of the record, but actually happened, the biographical note that tells us that Jesus actually did this. But we're also asked to think about where we are, how we relate to that story, and learn, in fact, both from the positive example of the man born blind, as well as the negative example of the Pharisees. So, it looks like this. Let's pretend. Let's pretend Andrew is the man born blind. I walk over, if I'm Jesus, I walk over to him. He doesn't know I'm coming, but the blindness of this man is indicative not just of the fact that he physically cannot see, but he has been condemned. Remember who sinned, this man or his family? In other words, what's going on is some kind of really wicked divine justice that this has happened to him for reasons. And Jesus says, when the question gets asked, oh, no, 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 that's not even the right question. This man needs to be healed. I'm here to bring the glory of God. He breaks into the, he, you know, the, he doesn't even ask the man. You see, I'm not even sure since the man was born blind. And there is, in fact, no record in the entire Bible of a man who had the congenital birth defect of not being able to see, actually, miraculously, being made to see. This is a very unique story in that way. So the man doesn't even know enough to actually ask to be healed because it's not even in his frame of reference. For him, he's probably believed everything that's been spoken. Well, I don't know what you did or what your family did, but I guess you're getting what you deserve. That's really too bad. Can you imagine? If you've heard that kind of condemnation all your life, do you actually think it is even within you to be able to ask for something that you know you in no way deserve? And so Jesus takes the initiative, creates the mud out of spit and dirt, pours it on the man's eyes, and says, and you can tell, he knows the way, he knows how to get around even though he can't see, go and wash your eyes, and the pool of Siloam, the name is actually mentioned. And that's meant to say something because, as it says, Siloam means sent. In other words, something's going to happen to you that's bigger than just your eyes being able to see. As extraordinary as that is, you, man born blind, used to be thought of as cursed by God. I'm sending you. In fact, William Temple, commented, commenting on these verses, says this is an apostolic sending. Something is happening in this man that's not just changing his eyes, it's literally changing his heart, which we see because, and I love the way you read the humor out of it, Jerry. When Jerry begins, with Jerry, when the man born blind begins to interact with the Pharisees, he doesn't act like any kind of beaten down beggar. He actually challenges the authority of the Pharisees. Now, this is something. Don't you know what's happened to me and who this man is? How can he be a sinner? I mean, we're, we live in the kind of democratic society that is, doesn't think challenging authority is unusual, that was shocking behavior. That man had been a beggar all of his life. For him to literally stand up and challenge the Pharisee authority, I'm, I'm sure his parents were like, oh no, this is it. Because <laughs> that just was not done, you see. And it's all meant to show that the physical change literally changed his heart. It reversed his character. 
I mean, it, it, the, for me, the extraordinary miracle is not just that the man could physically see, but after literally years, he's an adult now, he is of age, remember, so how long has that been, we don't know, who had been beaten down and told all of his life that he was cursed, that he was forsaken by God, that he deserved nothing from anybody. Out of all of that, he literally stands up and challenges the Pharisaic authority. This is not the same heart. He's been changed on the inside out. And see, that's what we're actually supposed to notice. So, getting back to the man born blind, in this case, Father Andrew. If I'm Jesus and I walk over and he can see and I send him away, something powerful has happened. And it's a recognition of not only a physical, the need for a physical change, but a heart change as well. It's what happens in the epistle when Paul says, once you were what? Not in darkness, once you were darkness. Me? Really? It's certainly not how we think of ourselves, huh? But now you are light in the Lord. It's that's, that in that phrase is literally a description of what happened to that man born blind. But what if the man had said, I don't know what you're doing to my eyes, but listen, I want to stay right here. It's really scary out there. And I don't know what to do. And so if you could help me out with a little money, that would be fine. But go do your stuff someplace else. The mercy of it is, is that Jesus operated and just did it. He, unlike some of the other stories, he didn't even ask the man's permission. You know, other stories, it's like, what do you want me to do? He doesn't ask that. He just pops right in and does it. And the reason that's so important is because, quite honestly, for us, we're similar in that. God wants to do things in our lives that, much, that are much larger, much deeper than anything we could ever imagine. I mean, we're, we're so used to our kind of normal life, which if you're Christian, it's really a kind of a mixture of darkness and light, of sin and righteousness, and all of the struggles that you and I have, and we sort of say to one another, well, you know, you're only human. We know how to get by, as it were. And, and if that's all we know, and particularly if that's all we think is possible, we don't have it within us to actually somehow ask God to do the kind of breakthrough work that literally changes us and puts us in a new place. Because we can't even imagine that happening to ourselves. And because we can't imagine it, we don't even know how to ask for it. And a lot of that has to do with we don't see not only the potential of what's possible, we also do not see the depth of the darkness that is within us. Oh yeah, you get guilty of occasionally when you lie or commit some kind of moral in, you know, indiscretion or things like that. I mean, we all have kind of made peace with our weaknesses, have we not? Nod your head. Yeah. And so we know how to ask God to forgive us, but, but the literally the turnaround, make a difference miracle inside of our heart that this story is supposed to inspire us to be able to see is way beyond our frame of reference. And that's what we're invited into. Because you see, otherwise, if we're not willing to say to God, you know, I don't even know how to ask for this. I know how to ask for these things. I, I don't know how to ask you to change, literally, the parts of my heart that I know and the parts of my heart that I don't know at all. We don't know how to do that. And so as a result, more often than not, when God begins to invite us into something that's really new, really transformative, we end up not like the man born blind, but like the Pharisees. You know, that doesn't fit into my frame of reference. What do you mean you want me to do that? Um, that's not according to what I've been taught. You see, I actually have some empathy for the Pharisees. Because all the Pharisees were doing were responding to everything they'd always been taught for generations. I mean, the story is, here's the law. 
If you obey the law, God blesses you. If you don't obey the law, then yeah, you're in trouble this time. <laughs> and so here comes Jesus, and he begins to say, you know, I think people are more important sometimes than the rules. That's the compassion of God. And so he does the thing that is, in fact, against the law. He, he makes clay. You see, that's work. So he's broken the Sabbath, much less performed the healing. It's kind of funny in a way, because if, if we saw somebody who'd been blind from birth miraculously healed, we wouldn't have cared what day it was. But the point is that for them, that's transgression. And therefore, how can God honor that? So, in essence, what this is asking us into is not just the change of heart, but literally for God to reframe the way we think, the way we think about who God is, the way we think about who we are in relationship to God, as well as the plan and the path that God has for our lives. Because I want to tell you, my hunch is, is that it's probably a lot different than most of what we know. You see, all of us in our relationship with God have created a settle point. As in, I know how to ask Jesus to forgive me for my sins. I know that I belong to him and that he loves me. I, I know I'm probably going to go to heaven when I die because I'm baptized. I believe in the resurrection and I can say Jesus is Lord. And therefore, hopefully at my funeral, they'll say all those promises and they'll be true for me. Meanwhile, we do the best we can with what we have. Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's true for me. But I have this hunch, not just in this story, but literally all through the Gospel of John, that there is something that God places in us that stirs, that longs for something deeper, richer, for more. And I want to say to you, God has put that in you. That's God. Because if you look at the way Jesus deals with his disciples, he's always literally taking them by the hand and leading them into places that they never, ever would have imagined. And as a result, because they continued to trust him, to recognize, yes, you are my shepherd, they became literally world changers in their generation. That's why we remember them even to this day. <laughs> Not because they were morally good, but because God used them in extraordinary ways. And the invitation of this story is, are you willing to be led? Are you willing for Jesus to take you by the hand and show you things that you haven't ever known before? Are you willing to discover things about him and about his presence that literally changes you from the inside out? Are you willing to say to God, Lord, I want something more than just settling? I think he'll do that. I think he will do that. Because God's passion and his love for the world is much larger than anything you and I know. And it's really easy for us churchgoers to function like Pharisees, to think it needs to be done this way, and anything other than that really probably isn't from God. And in the meantime, God is looking at a world that longs to hear his story and his good news, to know that they, in fact, can be forgiven, that they can know the depths of his presence, that they can be used by God to literally change things as they know them and be changed by him. That's the gospel. It's not just, I'm forgiven and yeah, I'm going to go to heaven. As phenomenal as that is, that's not the whole story. The whole story is God actually taking you, if you're willing to be led and be used by him in ways that you could never imagine in the lives of other people, in your community, and maybe even in other parts of the world. Who knows? You see, it's up to him. Oh, you mean it's up to him? You mean I don't get to say... Oh, I don't think I want to do that, God. Well, of course you can say that. And God is gracious enough to be able to say, well, if that's what you want. But I have to tell you, in my own heart, 
The last thing I want is for God to walk away. Oh yeah, I'm still His. I still belong to Him. But what, I, what happens is, is that I, I miss out. That's the glory of it. Is that it, it's not that I'm no longer a believer, but I miss out on the infinite possibilities of what could happen in my life if I'm willing to say yes and continue to say yes. It wasn't that the Pharisees weren't good Jews. They continued to obey the law, but they missed the very invitation of the presence of God that was literally right in front of them, but they could not see it because it didn't conform with what they had thought God's presence was. I think that still happens. I have this sense that many of us are so wrapped up into our assumptions about who God is and about what He wants of us in terms of our lives that we, the opportunities come and they just literally pass us by. For most of us, I think when the accounting is settled and we stand before God at the very end of time, we will be very surprised not at the sins of commission, because we know those really well. But instead, it's the omissions, the things that could have been possible. But we said no to them, because that's not what we wanted for our lives. A part of what happens when people are confirmed is that they're willing to say to God in that confirmation, Lord, I don't know everything that you want, but I want to keep saying yes. And as you stand and work with these and pray with these who are being confirmed, to reaffirm those commitments are in many ways you saying, oh, I'm willing to keep saying yes too. <laughs> so I didn't know whether you thought that was going to happen today, but it is. Because I actually believe with all of my heart that God loves us so passionately and so powerfully. He wants us to get in on what it is that He is doing and have the thrill and the joy of knowing that in our lives. Of actually being a vessel through which extraordinary things happen. As we learn in whole new ways what it means to passionately love people and to love God with all of our hearts. You don't have to have that if you don't want it. God's very gracious in that regard. But there will be so many things that you'll just miss out on that you won't understand. And in fact, worse, like the Pharisees, you could end up literally opposing the very people who are following God because it's not how you thought it was supposed to be. It's a part of the message of this story. The people who were in fact responsible for maintaining the religious traditions of Israel were the very ones who stood against what the man born blind was doing. That's a part of the message. People will oppose you if you take this kind of adventurous stand for Christ. But so what? This is worth it. So please do not merely read this story as a miraculous indication that G Jesus is who he says he is, the light of the world. It is that, but it is also so much more. It's a challenge. Who are you willing to be, the beggar or the Pharisee? And you can't not choose. And if you're willing to be the beggar who admits his own darkness, who is willing to be led, I want to promise you that God is going to change your life. Just as that beggar became a man who challenged the Pharisees, literally became a different human being, so God will do that in you and use you in ways that you could never, ever have imagined. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we confess to you that it is very difficult, stubborn, wanting to be in control as we are, wanting to be sure and certain and right. It's so hard to be led. 
to say yes to your invitation for you to be our shepherd. To change us, to teach us, and to lead us in places that, gosh, we never ever would have thought would be true for ourselves. But, oh Lord, even as you came to the man born blind who didn't even know how to ask, Lord, we confess to you, we don't quite know how to ask for this. All we want to do is say, we want to be those who are learning how to say yes. We want to be those who continue to say yes. No matter what. Protect us, O oh Lord, from the hypocritical surety of being a Pharisee. And make us your servants that we might more and more go from darkness to light and be channels of that glorious and wondrous light. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.